Number 11. Type 21 U-Boat Built by the Germans, the diesel-electric powered Type 21 was the first submarine that was designed to operate primarily submerged, rather than as a surface vessel that could periodically go underwater for short periods to evade detection. Equipped with many more batteries than conventional submarines for the time, it was capable of submerging for several days at a time. When the Type 21 was underwater at length, it only came close to the surface to recharge through a snorkel. It featured numerous other improvements from previous subs, including nicer crew accommodation and an improved hull design which enabled greater underwater speed. But the submarine ultimately proved to be mechanically unreliable, vulnerable to damage in combat, and built in a hurry at inexperienced facilities. Production of the Type 21 started in 1944, and altogether 118 were built. But only four were actually combat ready, and only two were put into service during World War II. After the conflict ended, some of the subs were acquired by the navies of various countries, and several new submarine designs were at least partially based on the Type 21. Number 10. The Atomic Bomb Starting in 1942, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers led the development of the world's first nuclear weapon. Famously known as the Manhattan Project, the undertaking got its start due to fears that the Germans were developing similar technology. Research and tests were carried out at numerous sites throughout the U.S. and Canada, including in New Mexico, Tennessee, and Washington. The atomic bomb was designed based on the concept of nuclear fission, which is when the nucleus of an atom splits in two and releases an enormous amount of energy. In 1943, theoretical physicist and top nuclear fission researcher J. Robert Oppenheimer became the director of the Los Alamos Laboratory in northern New Mexico. The first Manhattan Project bombs were built and tested there in 1943. Two years later, scientists executed the first successful detonation known as the Trinity Test. The atomic age had officially begun. Two different types of bombs, the uranium-based Little Boy and the plutonium-based Fat Man, were developed at Los Alamos. The Little Boy had not been tested when American forces dropped it on the Japanese city of Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, killing as many as 80,000 civilians. Three days went by without a declaration of surrender from Japan, prompting the U.S. military to drop the Fat Man bomb over the city of Nagasaki, killing tens of thousands more. The American government held a monopoly over nuclear energy until 1964, when President Lyndon B. Johnson began allowing private ownership of nuclear materials. Since then, nuclear fission technology has served as the basis for innovations in energy, medicine, and other non-combat-related industries. Number 9. Radar the earliest radar experiments were carried out during the late 19th century, but the first practical radar system wasn't produced until 1935. Developed by British physicist Sir Robert Watson Watt, the technology led to the establishment of a network of radar stations along England's eastern and southern coasts. This early radar system was designed with the hopes of transmitting beams of electromagnetic energy at enemy vehicles and harming their operators. It didn't work, but not all was lost. Developers realized that even if radar was useless as a weapon, it functioned well as a detection system. They worked to improve it while numerous other countries worked to develop radar systems of their own, including the U.S., the Soviet Union, Germany, and Japan. Radar advanced rapidly during World War II and is credited with playing a major role in securing an Allied victory. With its ability to detect enemy ships and planes, it proved to be a game-changer when it came to securing an upper hand in the conflict. After the war, radar technology was expanded for use in meteorology, civilian aviation, marine navigation, law enforcement, and medicine. Number 8. V-2 Rocket During World War II, the work of German rocket scientist Werner von Braun caught the attention of the Nazis, who summoned his help with designing the world's first long-range guided ballistic missile. Over 3,000 of the Vergeltungswaffe II, or V-2 rocket, were launched against the Allies starting in September 1944. No effective defense existed against the missiles, which flew at supersonic speed, hit with little to no warning, and were more or less unstoppable in their paths. V-2 rockets were responsible for killing an estimated 9,000 civilians and military personnel, as well as around 12,000 forced laborers and concentration camp prisoners who were forced to help make the weapons. Allied forces made it a priority to seize production facilities and launch sites, as well as the V-2 technology itself, so that they could learn how the rockets were made. They were successful in their mission and also ended up capturing over 100 V-2 team members. Many of them, including von Braun, were among the 1,600 German scientists, engineers, and technicians who were secretly moved to the United States and began working for the American government as part of Operation Paperclip. After the war, the Soviets occupied the V-2 manufacturing facilities and eventually moved production to the Soviet Union. 
According to Interesting Engineering, the five first-stage engines that von Braun designed for the rocket are the most powerful single-chamber liquid-fueled rocket engines ever made. Number 7. Jet Engines British Royal Air Force engineer Frank Whittle filed the first jet engine patent in 1930. Around the same time, German engineer Hans Joachim Pabst von Ohain was working on his own version of the technology. Germany became the first country to fly a jet engine plane just days before invading Poland in 1939, earning Ohain the distinction of being the designer of the first operational jet engine. Whittle's gas turbine engine powered the first British jet, which flew for the first time in 1941. Germany started preparing for World War II about a decade in advance, which could be partially why it beat England to flying the first jet-powered plane. England began ramping up its efforts to develop jet engine technology with the onset of the war, basing its first jets on Whittle's designs. The U.S. lagged behind both countries. Designed and built in 1943, the country's first jet fighter, the Lockheed P-80A, saw very limited service in Italy just before the war ended. The model was used far more extensively in the Korean War as the F-80. These fighter aircraft marked the beginning of a period in aviation history known as the Jet Age, which brought major changes to both the military and civilian worlds. Jet engines enabled planes to fly higher, faster, and farther than previous technology, making transcontinental travel more convenient than ever before. Number 6. Kabar Knife it wasn't long after the U.S. entered World War II that Army soldiers and Marines began complaining about the substandard World War I-era trench knives that had been issued to them. The weapon's grip was inefficient for hand-to-hand -hand combat, and its blade was thin and prone to breakage, even during ordinary tasks. In 1942, the Marine Corps authorized the development of a better knife that was more suited to the needs of soldiers who were fighting in the war. The Kabar Knife Company submitted a design for the improved fighting and utility knife. It was sturdy, easy to manufacture, and practical to use, and soon became the standard-issue knife among all U.S. military branches. After the war, the Kabar knife remained popular. It was unofficially used in several ensuing conflicts, including the Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, and Iraq wars. Do you know anyone that has one of these knives? Let us know in the comments if you've ever seen one up close. Number 5. Pressurized Cabins Modern airplane cabins are pressurized, meaning air is pumped into them to mimic the atmosphere at sea level. This is necessary to prevent hypoxia, a dangerous condition resulting from the lack of oxygen at high altitudes. Built in 1938, the Boeing 307 Stratoliner was the first aircraft with a pressurized cabin. Only 10 were ever made. The first planes that were used in World War II were not pressurized, so pilots and crew members relied on bottled oxygen and wore masks. A need for pressurized cabins emerged as bomber aircraft became larger and required crew to move around. The Boeing B-29 Superfortress was the first bomber with cabin pressurization, and it was equipped with the first mass-produced air pressure regulating system. Its fore and aft cabins were pressurized and connected by a tube that crew members could crawl through. There was also a separate pressurized compartment for the tail gunner, but it could only be accessed or exited at low altitudes that didn't require pressurization. Number 4. Enigma Machines during the war, the Nazis sent and received secret messages using a cipher device called an Enigma machine. Developed during the early to mid-20th century, the technology was incredibly secure, protecting German commercial, military, and diplomatic communications from the prying eyes of the Allies. Correspondence was written in what was known as Enigma code. The machine's electromechanical rotor system scrambled the letters of the alphabet into a unique cipher code that proved extremely hard to crack. Polish mathematicians successfully decoded the system and shared the information with the British. In the meantime, the Germans worked to make the code more difficult to decipher. To make things even more secure, the device's settings were reset daily. Led by mathematician Alan Turing, a team of British cryptographers called Ultra helped break the Enigma code by developing an advanced machine that made the process much easier. Hundreds of thousands of Enigma machines were produced, but only a few hundred are known to exist today. Many were destroyed or thrown overboard shortly before the Nazis surrendered in 1945 in an effort to keep them from falling into Allied hands. Consequently, it's extremely rare for one to be discovered. Number 3. Superior Small Arms During the Civil War, both Union and Confederate forces struggled to work with the dozens of different ammunition sizes that were being used in combat. Between then and World War II, the U.S. made it a priority to improve this logistical nightmare, reducing its array of small arms to just three different calibers. Despite some improvements coming to these weapons, the delivery of proper ammunition remained a huge problem and came with a lot of confusion. This led to further post-war efforts to standardize both American and Allied ammunition. 
Additionally, the conflict saw the development of the first semi-automatic and assault rifles, including the self-loading American M1 Garand rifle, nicknamed the Yankee Self-Loader, and the German FG-42 and the Sturmgewehr 44. After the war, the United States incorporated elements of German machine gun technology into its M60 machine gun design. One of the most popular weapons of World War II was the American-made M2 Browning 50 caliber machine gun. Almost two million of the weapons were manufactured for soldiers fighting on land, in the air, and on the water. In addition to being incredibly versatile, the M2 was extremely powerful with its ability to fire 550 rounds per minute at a range of over four miles. Number two, aircraft carriers. Military pilots began landing airplanes on ships shortly before World War I, when ordinary naval vessels were outfitted with landing strips. The first true purpose-built aircraft carriers were developed during the 1920s by the Japanese. But the technology really took off during World War II, as many of the conflict's greatest battles were fought at sea. By 1941, the Japanese owned nine aircraft carriers. Each of their two largest ships were capable of launching at least 90 planes. Meanwhile, the British and the Americans developed comparably effective aircraft carriers that had a carrying capacity of 100 or more planes. Consequently, there were numerous clashes between Allied and Japanese carrier fleets. The earliest ships of this type often had a short airstrip, requiring the help of a catapulting device to get the planes in the air. But they were nevertheless highly effective. Aircraft carrier technology advanced rapidly throughout the war, and by 1945, aircraft carriers were the primary offensive naval weapon. Dozens were built in the U.S., but by the time some of them were finished, it was too late for them to play a major role in the war, causing several ships that were on order to be canceled. The conflict set the stage for the continued development of aircraft carriers, but only nine countries own them, and the U.S. and Britain are the only militaries that rely heavily on them today. There are currently 12 American and three British aircraft carriers. Number one, improved tanks. The first tanks were used at the end of World War I and in a very limited capacity. Between then and World War II, tank technology improved significantly. The vehicles became faster and more powerful and saw numerous other upgrades, including to their weaponry and track and suspension systems. Along with these improvements, the role that tanks played in combat grew. Numerous countries prioritized tank development, including the U.S., Germany, the Soviet Union, Great Britain, and France, just to name a few. At the war's outset, the U.S. relied on its light and maneuverable but poorly armored M2 series. It was replaced in 1942 by the much more popular M4 Sherman medium tank. Around 500,000 of the vehicles were produced between then and 1945, and they continued to be used long after the war ended. The M4 Sherman's replacement, known as the M26 Pershing, was the first heavy army tank. Its design represented a significant diversion from its predecessor, and it boasted major improvements in firepower, protection, and mobility. The M26 Pershing made its debut toward the end of the war and was used extensively in the Allied invasion of Germany as well as the Korean War. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more videos like these. Thanks again and we'll see you next time for another amazing video right here on American Eye.